we have just about an hour, which is really great because we are um, accompanied here by three very um, well-respected attorneys and um, who are known for their intelligence as well as their loquaciousness. So we will give each of them um, a few minutes to introduce themselves as well as their areas of expertise. Um, I want to invite you all, we have, we have some topics we're gonna cover, um, but if you have any questions for the panelists, um, you are very welcome to tweet them at me, um, at jory.com on Twitter, uh, and I'd be happy to work those into the conversation. Um, you know, we have to say, as, as Wendy likes to tell me, that um, these lawyers are not your lawyers. So, um, uh, you know, bear that in mind. Um, definitely, if you have specific questions related to your projects, you should retain your own counsel. Um, and uh, friends, our safe word today is amicus brief. So if we're going on too long, I'm just kidding, we can uh, use that to to skip to the next question. But um, I would like to start uh, maybe with my, my colleague Jamie, um, if you don't mind sharing a few uh, minutes of introducing yourself and, and uh, your areas of expertise, please. Hi, I'm Jamie Clark. I grew up in Minnesota. I live in LA now. I am uh, from and currently the general counsel of the Open Standards and Open Source Group Oasis, which created a lot of stuff over the last 20 years or so, although not quite as much as Wendy's group, uh, who's been terribly prolific. Uh, we probably lived mostly in the e-commerce and structured uh, documents area. So if you've heard of Oasis, you've heard about it either because of security stuff like SAML or uh, Sticks and Taxi, or you've heard about it because of structured e-government stuff like open document format. Uh, I happened into this because when I was a baby lawyer a long time ago, I had some clients come to me and say, so I got some salesmen from a large company that wanted to sell me all this electronic stuff and I don't have to use paper anymore. I can reduce it all to records and have it all be electronic. Only I just don't know if any of that will work if I go to the court and say, Your Honor, here's my contract. And I hope, you know, show them this paper or this tape or something. Does that work? Is it enforceable? And in 1998 or so, it wasn't. So I got dragged into about 15 years of trying to make sure electronic signatures actually were recognized as legal signatures, which, as you know, is kind of old hat now. But boy, were courts confused by those things in the first place. And so eventually I went pro, went to my wife and say, Honey, can I go work for a foundation and take a pay cut of about nine tenths of my salary? And <laughs> do cool internet stuff for the rest of my life? And she said, oh, fine, if you have to. So here I am, uh, working for Oasis, mostly helping keep their open source and open standards programs on the straight and narrow and kind of uh, doing things in ways that are cooperative and usually not illegal, immoral, or fattening. Uh, we are all lawyers in different roles. And I just want to say our job uh, is actually um, pretty well predicted. I mean, you could actually do a UML chart for our job because the idea is as a package, we're supposed to take all those crazy bad things can happen to you and roll them up into black boxes and give you rules and suggestions and guidelines and templates for how to do your thing without having to think about us. And then we're supposed to basically disappear. Basically, if facilitators and lawyers and rules people and licensed people do a good job of creating your community and helping you guide through stuff and figure out what to avoid, then you can just go off and be devs and work on stuff and have committees and cooperate and never have to crack a rule book or a, a Robert's Rules or a, a procedure thing or a license. We really ought to be just making it possible for people to collaborate in a safe space without running into you know, uh, multiple kinds of legal problems. So if we do our job well, hopefully we become invisible. Uh, so far, not so good. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I usually refer to us as uh, as an API to the rest of the legal system where uh, hopefully you don't have to worry about the implement de implementation details. Sometimes it does leak through. Um, so, so hi, I'm Luis Villa. I am uh, an attorney, former programmer. I got involved in my baby lawyer story is that I was uh, at Zimium, which some of you may remember as a Linux desktop startup in the very distant past. Uh, we got acquired by Novell. I was involved in the I was in, involved in the diligence there and dealing with Novell's lawyers, and I naively, arrogantly thought, "Oh, I can do better than this." <laughs> um, and so, anyway, since then, I've been slowly learning how wrong that was. Uh, first at Mozilla, 
then for a while at Greenberg Chorg, big law firm working uh, on, with many of you probably worked for companies that were my clients then, uh, then at Wikimedia and now at a startup called Tidelift. Uh, what we do at Tidelift is we are building a platform to uh, help open source developers get paid for making open source work better, right? We believe, you can think of it almost as a red hat for the rest of the stack, uh, where we make things more secure, more reliable, we make the legal uh, stuff go more smoothly. And in exchange, enterprises pay us for that, and we pay the actual developers who are doing the work, right? The original uh, open source developers, not some random schmo in the cloud or a contractor, but the people who actually created the value, because we think uh, you know, open source has created literally hundreds of billions of dollars worth of value, uh, and it's time for open source developers to capture even a tiny little fragment of that. If that can be done, uh, then we will all be better off, right? Both the developers who capture some of that value and uh, hopefully the companies that uh, are our customers by making it a little more robust. And my interest in this stuff has always been uh, about licensing. Uh, and about how people work together, and licensing is, is a way that that happens, they're not the only way. So, yeah, uh, I guess, yeah, so with that. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm Wendy Seltzer. I am uh, strategy lead and counsel at the World Wide Web Consortium, W3C. Um, I got there through a winding path of uh, you know, interest in law and uh, open source and uh, in the early days of fighting the, the copyright term extension and copyright claim overreach, I founded the uh, Chilling Effects Clearinghouse project now known as Lumen Database, uh, tracking uh, notice and takedown uh, requests and giving people the uh, legal information to help them uh, fight back against uh, misguided requests. Um, and like Lewis and Jamie, my interest has been in the ways that law can help creative people do uh, the things that they want to do without the law getting in the way, uh, whether that's artists creating works that build upon uh, the creative works of others and add new things to our cultural discourse, uh, fighting some of the, the copyright restrictions, uh, or coders trying to, to work together to develop uh, interoperable platforms that anyone can use without paying patent royalties to someone who comes in, you know, asserting that everything uh, you've made is, you know, an, an infringement of, of their patent. Um, you know, I, I think law can actually help in creating uh, and reinforcing common infrastructure. So the best uses uh, of law, uh, I think of, are things like patent commitments and uh, copy left, places where people uh, agree not to assert legal claims against one another, but uh, to pool their, their resources and create uh, you know, opportunities for them and others to, to build value uh, on top of this uh, shared infrastructure. So at W3C, I uh, work on our you know, process and our patent policy to uh, help make that work for the ways that people are developing uh, web standards. So that sets uh, us Joy, up. Let me say one thing. Oh. Wendy's way, uh, <laughs> way too shy. Uh, Wendy is on the board of directors of Tor. She was one of the early staff members at EFF. I mean, I just try and get cool by standing around her. So read her resume. She's got an incredible background. We're both basically the legal people at two large standards consortiums, but she's the cool one. Uh, well, you get to keep that one. Uh, agreed. Plus one. Wendy, badass. Um, you've also set us up really nicely to talk about a text that has been um, kind of making the rounds quite a bit in the open source world and also um, among your community as well, uh, which is the uh, Eleanor Ostrom's work on, on governing the commons. Um, and we have talked a lot about sort of um, the commons, common infrastructure support, but then there's also this idea of the tragedy of the commons, that it's doomed to fail. Um, and we we started with a really lovely conversation last night. You said it really well, Lewis, that not all commons are tragic. I wonder if you could, could introduce us to that. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I think one way that we think of ourselves uh, is as engineers of healthy commons, right? And there's this, uh, I think for a long time, particularly in the US, but uh, globally, uh, a lot of economists have pushed this vision of the, the tragedy of the commons, right? Mm -hmm. And that 
all commons ultimately are overrun. People take too much and give too little. Um, and I wanted to set the table a little bit for today's conversation by saying that actually Eleanor Ostrom, who won the uh, Nobel Prize for Economics in 2009, I believe, mm -hmm. um, devoted her career to studying all the commons that aren't tragic, right, that do succeed. And she identified over 900 commons in her research. Uh, often they were water commons. In fact, some of them originally in LA. Uh, and I then went, then spent a career and the careers of many grad students identifying common themes, right? What are things that actually make those commons work? And I'm gonna go through and highlight a few of these and they are all gonna sound very familiar to you because you're going to have seen them in the communities that you are part of that work well, you're gonna have seen them. They're mm -hmm. gonna ring a bell, right? So uh, one thing that she talked about is clearly defined boundaries. You have to know who's in and who's out, right? Uh, modularity is the, is the word that we use for this in our space, right? We know who's participating, how they participate uh, in a way that's very clear for everybody. There's proportional equivalence between benefits and costs. In other words, you don't want people who are purely free riding, you want to have hopefully some way for them to contribute. Um, we talk about, she talks about monitoring. You have to know how it's being used. This is something, frankly, that open source maybe doesn't do so well and could learn from, right? Where we have a sense of, uh, we have a sense of our stars on GitHub and our NPM counts, but that's maybe about it, right? Uh, she talks about uh, fast and fair conflict resolution, right? The more clear things are, the better for everybody. This is one of the things that we try to bring in in our work is making sure uh, and one of the things I'm most proud of in my career is the Mozilla Public License version two, where it's a copy left, but it's a copy left with very clear boundaries. Um, a couple others that I think I'll skip over here, but th the point that I wanted to drive home is that there are patterns that we can know and follow in making healthy communities. This is not magic, it's not, uh, you know, it's not something that we have to reinvent all these wheels, and hopefully that's something that lawyers can help with as you all focus on the technology. Let me, let me contextualize that a little bit. What's the point of that list? Well, it, not, it got Lynn Ostrom the Nobel, and that's nice, but also you'll find a bunch of public policy issues. You'll find WTO principles uh, about standards and what's a real standard and what's a fake standard. You'll find uh, accreditation bodies in both open source and open standards that test bodies to say, okay, are we gonna allow you to submit yourself to other places? Are governments going to include your stuff in their procurement requirements? And they test a lot of those same conditions. Furthermore, those are the preconditions to fairness. If you're putting an effort, uh, you know, are you likely to get something out of it? Are you likely to get railroaded? Are you likely to get big-footed? Uh, uh, the simple way to look at that stuff from your standpoint, whether it's not just in Node.js, which is fairly mature now and has a pretty good governance system so far, but in any open source or open development shared project is, if you have that stuff there, if you can detect fair conflict resolution, modularity, transparency, yada, 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 then you're probably in a good place and your, your work's probably gonna work out pretty well, it, or at least you're gonna get a fair shot. If those things are not present, if you're designing a community and you don't have, haven't provided for that, or if you're in a place and they do don't, those, those things, the project has a very strong chance of failing. So you might think of them almost as health indicators mm -hmm. for open shared projects, which includes you know, standard stuff like uh, Wendy's organization of mine and ISO and ANSI and everybody else have been doing for 30, 40 years, but also includes the next open source project created tomorrow. Um, Jamie, one other thing that you had um, pointed out was that, you know, that in a similar vein, that standards development organizations kind of get evaluated on the same um, uh, principles. Um, I wonder if you could speak a little bit more to that. Well, we've been doing some interesting engineering lately because the traditional sources of open development, like open standards groups, like Wendy's and mine, have all been under, we think, good market pressure to adopt open source methods and tools. And so you wouldn't have seen any, you wouldn't have seen a lot of SourceForge material in the mainstream of a W3C recommendation or a Oasis standard 10 years ago. There was some, because we've always had our standards sort of supported by and SourceForge pre-GitHub uh, open source builds as kind of proofs of concept. But in terms of where the actual, you know, the, the canonical standard lives, uh, now you can go to GitHub and find a lot of them 
for W3C or Oasis. And increasingly, even some of the ISOs and the fuddy-duddies, I'm sorry, like IEEE, are trying to find ways to put their stuff there because that's where people want to find it. You know, I mean, do you have an SPDX tag on your standard? Well, if you don't, uh, if you're taking, uh, you know, your uh, uh, comments against the standard and you're not getting them as PRs, then a lot of people won't know where to find it or know what to do with them or be able to, you know, communicate that in a uh, modern development environment. So we are kind of fishing in the same streams now. There, there is a difference, which I think is worth mentioning, uh, and this is not about licensing, which we'll get to later. Uh, standards have the benefit of having 20 or 30 years of experience with uh, government and large company procurement. Uh, people kind of know, institutional adopters kind of know we're a safe place to borrow material. And so if something is created as a standard, uh, you know, you don't get a lot of flack from some European Commission department that wants to adopt it because they're comfortable with standards. And you know how to do that. Uh, the whole web accessibility movement, which was just practically missing from some of the early parts of the web, got started as a consortium project a W3C, and now it has been readopted and picked up and enacted its law in Europe, it's, you know, and everybody's guidelines and every, but basically the thing that made it comfortable for large agencies and large governments and large companies to broadly adopt it is because of the stability of having an infrastructure like W3C's approval process to rely on. So a benefit we get from open standards is that everybody knows what they are. Uh, the history of procurement of open source work has been spotty because a lot of lawyers and a lot of companies were very standoffish about it at first. It was seemed as a more chaotic process. Its licensing was regarded as not as clear and not as reliable. And so open source, as it matures, is finding a better kind of frame within procurement as a safer place. For us at Oasis, we are now actually creating some open standards using open source licenses. And so it's been sort of interesting to take that stuff back to an ISO or a procurement agent and say, yeah, it's a standard, but it's also open source. And yes, that's OK, and it won't bite you, uh, which is kind of a new concept for a lot of traditional users. Uh, but the, what I want to convey here is that there's a sanctioning aspect. There's a operating according to known rules and procedures and licenses so that people know that as a safe, as, as a source of whether it's code, specs, models, or APIs, that you're a safe place from which users can widely adopt your stuff. And that, that, that sense of how to run things safely and clearly and with known licensing and known consequences and known boundaries is hugely important when the people who we talk to come to us and say, hey, I heard there's this thing, there's this module from something called the Node.js Foundation that does this yada yada thing, which I've never heard of. Can I use it? Is this as safe as if I went and used an ISO standard? Uh, you know, bottom line, you want the answer to be yes. You know, let me, I mean, one thing that may make that really concrete, uh, lawyers are like programmers. There's a lot of, you could do a whole great panel just on analogies between lawyers and programmers, but one way that I think there's this, uh, you know, nobody ever got fired for buying IBM. And in the same way, we as lawyers seek to say, Ah, nobody ever got fired for choosing this license or choosing this standards body, right? Where it's it's a well accepted, everybody knows. Maybe you don't know the details, right? Like there are a lot of lawyers who use a lot of open source licenses who could not actually explain to you how they work, right? But because they're well understood, they're they're well like they know that other lawyers know, and so there's that network effect of learning uh, around these things. Good, Wendy. Yeah, and, and I, I think that that serves as a way of sort of division of, of expertise that, you know, programmers don't have to be experts in the licensing conditions or in all of the possible governance structures that uh, could be, be used, uh, that they, they can take patterns from uh, organizations that have done some of that work, found patterns that, that work well, uh, and are you know, relied upon, that work uh, in uh, legal enforcement, that work for government re re regulation, uh, that, and that work for communities. That you know, our process, uh, W3C's process, is uh, often accused of being too long and unwieldy and uh, too detailed, but at the same time, uh, it saves people from reinventing that structure every time they're trying to, to make a new decision. You know, y yes, sometimes you may need to uh, reinvent something because conditions have changed, 
but if you're doing something that's been done before, uh, the, the patterns that worked well in the past uh, may well serve you too. Uh, and so that's low friction, low barrier uh, to, to, to reuse uh, helps get the, you know, the, the focus on writing the best spec, making the best security considerations and privacy and accessibility and uh, strong interoperability and testing uh, and the things that we need to get you know, a clear base of running code. So I want to ask about um, the importance of um, having multiple stakeholders, but you actually just um, touched on something because we are speaking to a room of developers and programmers, um, and these documents are written for lawyers. What does a developer need to know about um, their open source license? Like, what what's the like thing? That's the small thing. <laughs> um, well, there are you know two key bundles of rights that um, are uh, included uh, in in most licenses: the the copyrights and the the, the patents. And you know, copyright is a protection for uh, I, uh, ideas fixed in a tangible medium of expression. Uh, your your code is uh, copyrightable and uh, and uh, those those using it uh, need a license that permits them to copy it as they do when they uh, use or modify or run the code, uh, and then uh, and and patents uh, which um, are uh, you know, more uh, the, the the idea the the, the function um, of code and uh, anyone can claim. Uh, well, the, the inventor uh, can claim uh, protection of the functionality, uh, even in something that somebody else implemented. Uh, and so um, a lot of um, open source licenses and a lot of uh, standards bodies work to uh, develop various ways of pooling uh, patent protections or defensive uh, rights so that uh, when, uh, so. For example, at W3C, we have a royalty-free uh, patent policy. Anyone who contributes uh, to a, uh, participates in the development of a specification uh, commits that they will not assert patents on so-called essential claims uh, to that spec. That you know, even if, uh, and uh, that, so that uh, even if they have patents uh, in their cupboard, uh, they won't uh, assert them against somebody who's trying to make an interoperable uh, implementation of uh, of, of, of a spec. Uh, the significance there is that if you're doing something in Wendy's shop under that patent policy, not only is everybody promising that you can use their contribution, which is also open source world, right, but also, also, they're promising that they won't sue you if you use the other guy's contribution. So if Wendy, Louie, I, and Jory are our committee, you know, each of us may promise that we will let you use our contributions, duh. But also, if there's a final product, you come out of a process like the standards process, uh, and this is true in a couple of open source projects, but not most. That also means that if you use my contributions, Louie won't sue you, and you, if you use Jory's contribution, uh, uh, you know, when he won't see you. This is a significant improvement in terms of stability. And so, for example, ripped out of the news yesterday. Anybody watch Twitter? See Jack Dorsey is saying, oh, gosh, you know, I've just realized that maybe there should be a, 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 a multi-company uh, uh, standard for, for tweets or for, you know, social media anyway. Uh, duh, duh, okay. And, uh, uh, you know, I mean, that's great. Good, good for him. Uh, and without any comment other than that, I would love to see something like that happen. I'll just point out that W3C had a project on that like, what, eight years ago? I mean, Evan Perlmutter made it up, who's up here, by the way, uh, uh, made up StatusNet maybe 10 years ago now and worked out a system for a while, and it became an, it came, became an activities at W3C, and they went through all the whole thing. Basically, basically, that whole idea got laundered through a process of multiple stakeholders and multiple contributors and fine licenses. And so basically, yeah, Jack, we already have one of those. Now, maybe it'll be adapted. Maybe something else will be better. But my point is, 
you are better off when you start from something that's been established through a process with multiple stakeholders, which is your point, and with some kind of stable understanding about the licenses, which is your point. And there are a lot of good things out there that have come from that process, uh, which is why we're all advocates of reuse, not reinventing the wheel every time, and refighting all the license battles. Yeah. I, I was actually going to say, uh, you know, Jory, you asked, like, what should we know? Yes, yeah. <laughs> There's it's really like, one thing you should know, and that is who else is using it, yeah. right? Like if you if you only know one thing, we are, and I say we here both about programmers and about lawyers. We are herd animals, and um, so uh, the idea that you know it, it's actually th there was a time when I first got involved in all this stuff, uh, the you know, everybody knew all the licenses, right? Like literally to become a Debian developer, which was sort of in some sense the spiritual forerunner of being, uh, of having a package on NPM, you literally had to pass a test to show that you knew all this stuff about all of the licenses, right? And uh, in some ways that was good. Everybody was an expert. Everybody had deep knowledge. And in other ways, that really got in the way of actually doing the thing we want to do, which is actually write some code, right? And um, and I think in some ways, in some ways, there's a sense of something. There's some loss there, right? Yeah. Um, but it's also, I think, you know, simply looking around the room and being like, you know what, the entire rest of the industry has been using the BSD license for thirty years, yeah, and it hasn't melted down yet. Like that's actually a pretty good proof point for like actually maybe we can probably keep using it for the next thirty years and it probably won't. Now if you get if you buy me a drink tonight, I will tell you all the ways in which it might melt down. But that <laughs> that's for another conversation. <laughs> Doom and gloom. Um, but but I think so. This this came from Twitter, but um, I think there's a bit of a tension here, right? Where we want to simplify things enough and just say, don't worry about it, developer community. Just you know. Um, it's, it's okay, we got it covered. But at the same time, we want to make sure that these communities are like, um, you know, knowledge is empowering. Like we want them to feel like this is knowable to them. And so, you know, what, what is the right sort of balance for that, you know, nervous um, developer who's trying to think about licensing their first project? Like, like really, is it just, you know, pick, um, well, I, I think if, if you're in a company, talk to your company's lawyers. <laughs> um, if you're working on your own, talk to a friendly lawyer and think about what it is that you or your organization are trying to protect. What are you trying to create and uh, what sort of legal structure helps you to do that? Um, and, you know, we have big companies and small companies and individuals who contribute to open standards and who contribute to that royalty-free pool because what they want to protect is the ability to interoperate and the ability to work with others in a safe environment where all of them know that none of them is going to pull a patent out of their back pocket and undermine this web we've created. And yeah, there's, there's room for patents and there's room for proprietary stuff on top of that stack. You have the core interoperable web and then you have optimizations that people can patent and applications that people can sell on top of that. And you know, over time, the core of the, the common royalty-free uh, piece grows and there are new opportunities further out on the edge to, you know, to de develop something uh, proprietary. Uh, and you know, that you know, grow the interoperable core and build something uh, of your own on top uh, is, is a powerful strategy um, and, you know, it, it can be a, a good strategy for, you know, selling your services, for selling your products, for uh, grow, expanding the value that you provide and create. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's the key, really, is understanding what it is you want to do, right? Mm -hmm. If this is a small piece of, I don't want to say throwaway JavaScript, right? But we know that there are a lot of modules on NPM that were a sort of weekend hack and are never going to be more than a weekend hack. 
And in that case, putting it under uh, the same license that everybody else uses on, on NPM, a BSD or MIT, something like that, so that everybody else just uses it in the same way they're used to is probably going to achieve your goals because your, your goals for publishing a weekend hack are like, I hope it's useful to somebody. And, and, you know, and if it is great and if it's not, I'm not going to worry about it. Right? But if you're like trying to start a business or you are already part of a business and you're trying to work with other businesses, then things get more complicated and you have to ask uh, deeper questions. I, you know, I will say uh, there's a spectrum here of not knowing anything on one side, actually going to law school on the other side. Do not recommend that if you're <laughs> thinking of that. If you're thinking of that, I will buy you the drink um, and we'll discuss tonight. Um, you know, and somewhere in between, there are a lot of good resources. In particular, I really like, uh, there's uh, a board member of the Python Software Foundation, Van Lindbergh, for also a former engineer turned lawyer, has written a really excellent book that explains a lot of these concepts uh, in, uh, that explains a lot of these concepts in like engineer accessible frameworks. Uh, and I highly recommend that book because it is, you know, Unfortunately, like the optimal level of understanding if you're asking complex questions like how do I work with other companies is probably closer to book length than panel length. Mm, of course. I am blanking on the name of the book. He's going to look up the name of the book for you. Uh, so if, if you're in that space, God willing, you do some of your work in an organization where they've got good and hardened rules and you can generally conduct yourself without worrying about it because the rules take care of it for you. They license rules, but also disclosure rules. You know that Node.js just adopted its I, a new IPR policy, as I understand it. So that I, I'm not an expert on it, but one of the questions is, okay, what does that cover? How does that cover me? How much disclosure is required? Am I in a competitive position where I am trying to donate some things, but keep other processes outside of my donation so that they can be my competitive advantage? If you read the old uh, Shapiro and Varian book, Information Rules, it talks richly about how the way to play the open source game from a enterprise point of view is to figure out what to give away to enjoy network effects and what to keep for your own proprietary processes. Everybody is doing that. Everybody has some things, some UX, some method, some algorithm, some spin, some profile that's their secret sauce. Uh, the best thing I can tell you as a lawyer to non-lawyers is going to these so things knowing darn well what your secret sauce is, if any, and what parts of it you're trying to give away and get everybody else to use versus what parts of it you or somebody else in your environment is trying to keep for themselves. When you get that wrong or when you're not clear or when the organization where you're doing the work is fuzzy and not careful, you get problems. And if those problems involve large economic risks, people sue each other and bad things happen. Uh, one word, rambus. R-A-M-B-U-S. Look it up. 10, 20 years ago. Whole series of cases about a standards group that fell on each other like a pack of wild dogs uh, because there were disclosures. The disclosures were thought to be not very clear. Uh, there was an allegation that you lied to me about your patent. Well, we didn't tell you. Well, we never said we didn't have one. Well, I'm going to sue you. Suit dismissed. Run to a regulator. Regulator looks at it and says, yeah, it wasn't against the rules because the rules are crappy, but it was deceptive anyway. You're under arrest. Big mess. So clear rules good, uh, fair, clear disclosure good, uh, working in places where they have clarity good, and above all, knowing what you're trying to protect and knowing what you want to share. So I think this um, segs really well into this uh, discussion of how IP and patent um, policies of, um, of different organizations sort of reinforce um, commons. And uh, I think you all were kind of touching on that. So um, I wonder, you know, you were talking about sort of like if uh, if you were just doing your weekend project and you select MIT because you know everybody else is like that's sort of reinforcing that that system. Um, can you speak to other ways in which um, you know our policies here can help reinforce that and improve the commons um, so it's not so tragic? <laughs> um, well I can you know, start with with one. I mean, so the the, uh, the W3C uh, royalty free patent policy offers a sort of recipro reciprocity term that you can condition the royalty free promise on everyone else's promise 
to make their patents available on the same spec, on the same terms. Uh, so that, and that reinforces the, the Ostrom principle of community, having a defined community. Those who are in and who are willing to commit to sort of sharing the, uh, the, the work of keeping this open get the rights to your work as well. And those who want to free ride, who want to take but not give, well, they face the, the risk of litigation by any one of the participants who uh, is otherwise making uh, that their patents available royalty free. Uh, and so it's, it's a, you know, anyone is free to enter so long as they're willing to, to make that commitment. Uh, and that's sort of a, a little lightweight co community boundary uh, that says, you know, here are the conditions, here are the rules that you need to agree to uh, if you want to be part of this commons. And, uh, and, and that helps to you know, build the, 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 the spirit of good, of good faith interaction and cooperation uh, that then can grow the, the, the commons. Yeah, I mean, there's so many, this, this is a tough one to unpack, so let me also give one example, yeah. right? So um, there, some of you may be aware that there's, uh, there's a couple different ways that you can say what the license on a code is. For a long time, the default was, I'm just gonna have a file called copying, and I'm gonna put the license in there, and that's gonna be good enough, right? And then some large corporations got involved and were like that, still makes us a little nervous because we don't have, we, you know, say Joe Schmo comes along and gives, uh, you know, submits a pull request. We didn't call them pull requests, but, you know, um, uh, you know, submits a pull request. Uh, have they agreed to those legal terms in that, in that one file? How do we know that they, how do we know that their employer has agreed to those terms, right? So one of the first early evolutions in open source licensing was, something called a contributor license agreement, where when a new contributor would come in off the internet and say, hey, I have an idea, here's, here's a patch, uh, everybody would, the gears would grind to a halt and everybody would say, uh, hey, that looks great, please fax me uh, this, uh, this doc, please print it out and fax it to me, or certified mail, also fine. Uh, and we will literally put it in a filing cabinet at the Apache Software Foundation, and uh, and we'll keep track of it just in case, right? Um, and in fact, I'm aware of a situation. This is this is semi public. Uh, given my track record, you can probably guess who it is here. But I, I've I've been aware of a case where a company sued over a piece of code. And the Apache Software Foundation opened up their file cabinet and said, but you gave us this piece of code. It says right <laughs> here, you gave it to us. Um, and the company backed down, right? Um, and so it wasn't a like purely hypothetical, well, here's the thing. I have been doing this for 20 years now, and I'm aware of exactly one case <laughs> in which that has been helpful, and there are literally thousands of these things on file, if yeah. not tens of thousands, right? Five of these are good. Oh, okay. When you're in a hardened environment, security systems, high value stuff, uh, you know, deep competition, that that's not a real thing. By the way, uh, Node.js has CLAs, doesn't it? I think you guys yes. do it. Well, we have a DCO. I mean, yeah. you, you guys so. do it as you know bytes set in a GitHub register at the moment, but. You got CLAs, it's just that they're not, yeah, they're no we don't fax them that. anymore. Yeah. <laughs> well, but let me, so, yeah. but at some point somebody said, hey, you know what, in most of these cases, the original things were written such that you could literally, like, if some random schmo off the internet came, submitted a patch, and it turns out they were lying about the source, you could sue them about it. Which was, like, nice in theory, but in fact, as a practical matter, uh, you know, none of us are what we would, what lawyers call deep pockets. Right, we're not like if Oracle wants to like come sue Joe Schmo, Oracle's going to realize like the cost is not worth like the benefit here, right? Because they are going to spend a lot more on lawyers than whatever Joe Schmo has in his pockets uh, to give to Oracle, right? Oracle are vindictive sons of bitches, but the, you know they're not dumb. Um, Google's a client. A former client, but I still have thoughts. Um, 
so we so a lot of so a lot of communities were a little concerned about this overhead of first faxing, you know, now it's GitHub stuff, but uh, and so somebody said, you know what, look, we're not going to go ahead and sue this person. Why don't we optimize that out? And we'll focus on instead simply being able to, to notify people, hey, you should really owe this and own this before you give it to us, and we should know who gave it to us, right? And that is where you got uh, the developer certificate of origin, the key point being there, we know where it came from so that if somebody sues us, we can look into it and we can take that code out if we need to, right? And that's where a DCO comes in, which is the default, I believe, it's, for so open all chance. of the projects are actually on different like uh, things, and so that that's that's part of this new policy as as a new foundation is like, okay, can we start to figure out like what the um, standard practice ought to be among thirty some odd projects that have been doing it differently for a number of years. And this is a great illustration. The, the point, the problem that the Node.js people have when designing a system like that is you got a bunch of people coming in with a bunch of different licenses, a bunch of different environments, a bunch of different practice in terms of people who like signing stuff and have a six pack of lawyers, people who don't. Some people are comfortable with DCOs, some aren't. And so you mm -hmm. have to construct a reasonably safe process. But let me try and abstract that into an action item for non lawyers, okay? What this tells you is that your first question in a development situation where you're contributing stuff you care about into a project you care about, is you need to decide whether you're in a relatively weasel-free environment. Because you see, if you are full of weasels, like arguably the Rambus people, or some of Louis's clients, or maybe I should say clients' opponents, but your mileage yeah. may vary. My clients are okay. Yeah, I've heard <laughs> that one before. Uh, if you're in a weasel-free or a highly competitive or a dueling licenses, pistols at dawn environment, then all this stuff is going to matter a lot more, and you get a lot more chance of contributing a whole lot of things that can then get swiped away from you, or overridden, or your project's suddenly been deep six because of a lawsuit or a threat of a lawsuit. Because believe me, a lot of the people dealing this are not brave warriors; they're craven. If you go booga booga, I'm going to sue you. They fold, and if you go booga booga, I'm going to sue you, and you got a lot of money. You know, I mean, I guess the Oracle, the Oracle Google case, on which we have no opinion because we have contributions from both sides. You got two rather large companies who are apparently not afraid of spending legal. I mean, I assume that when one of them calls the other, the reaction on the other end of the phone is, oh my God, stars and garters were, were lost. But a lot of the battles between parties who have opposite technical or licensing or patent positions are asymmetric. This is not a level mm -hmm. playing field. Yeah. So figure out how treacherous and how weasel free your environment is, and then you will know how much you want to sort of run for safety and make sure that you're working within a highly structured process or a process that has professional referees, mm -hmm. a process that's got a lot of output and has a lot of connections into other systems so that there's going to be people who want interference for you. Because I can assure you that when something goes to hell in a standards or open source project at my shop or Wendy's, we get calls. Uh, and we try to help them navigate it in some appropriate way without taking sides. And that can be a very important function. So the maturity of an organization also goes to you know, when that crazy thing happens, can you get help? Yeah, let me add one other. The, an unfortunate part of our uh, profession is that we are all professional pessimists. Uh, it is our job to see the issues coming. Like we are, we have finely tuned weasel radar, and we are we see those <laughs> weasels uh, from a lot further off than you do. Now, sometimes they are imaginary weasels. Right, and so the the unfortunate the balancing thing mm -hmm. here, right, is that we sometimes have to be the ones who are delivering this bad news of like because circumstances change, right? Like you know, you were when you were talking earlier about the patent situation, I couldn't help but think when when we all got involved, patent litigation about software. Uh, well, actually, this might not be true for you, Jamie, but the software litigation about patents, patent litigation about software rather, has come in waves, right? Where it didn't, for a long time, we didn't even think that software was patentable, and then we thought software was very patentable, and now we're back to like, maybe it's not very patentable again. So it feels like a little bit of a peaceful time mm -hmm. right now. There are no weasels on the horizon. Um, but in fact, uh, the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit, um, I'm not gonna call them weasels. <laughs> On, on we're being recorded, hi, yes, um, they're, they're wonderful, um, except when they're not, 
And then one day you wake up and all of a sudden the software is patentable again and all the lawyers, like, it's so depressing to me, like, engineers come to me full of all this energy and it's like, just help me build the thing. And you're like, okay, but bad news may come, <laughs> you know? And, and you have to be the one who sort of, who bears that bad news preemptively. I, I want to sort of add that you know a, a lot of our sort of long-term uh, weasel radar is looking at edge cases and exception handling, and litigation is for the most part in software and uh, the exception. Most of what we're doing is you know not suing one another, um, and most <laughs> of what we're doing in standards and open source uh, is trying to find cooperative solutions because. You know, the web isn't going to work, the uh, node software isn't going to work if it doesn't work together. Mm -hmm. And, you know, saying, I'm going to sue you for not interoperating with me uh, is a pretty poor way of getting interoperability. Much better to say, <laughs> what can you live with? What can I live with? Where's a compromise that makes each of us enough better off that we've got a package that works, we've got a standard that works, we've got an API uh, that we all agree to, inter to implement, not because someone comes down with a lawsuit saying thou shalt, but because you know that's what's gonna work for our product and our customer teams and our you know, collaborators. I mean, absolutely, we're all, uh, we all have this radar for problems. The best lawyers are the ones who have the radar for problems and help you get to a solution anyway, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's unfortunately, I think what separates not great lawyers from great lawyers and, and uh, we're all spoken for, so, but like, <laughs> but we have a Rolodex, so if you ever have a lawyer saying no to you, you know, come find us and we'll hook you up with somebody who will find a way to say, you know, find a way to give you answers. One more thing. Uh, all the stuff that we're doing that we think of as being web interface, cool, uh, screens, mobile, all that, the things you hear 90% of the work here talked about this. You know, that's one part of the world, and perhaps that is a relatively weasel-free environment, as Lewis suggests. But I got to tell you, I do, and I know Wendy's shop is doing a lot of work in automotive, in IoT, in uh, security, and those are not uh, 5G, good God, telecoms, those are not weasel-free or patent-free domains. Mm -hmm. So I think it would be uh, and, oh, I, sh I should say, you know, I was just listening to the Technical Steering Committee of Node.js earlier today and hearing the guys talk about all their ports of the basic core over to all kinds of funky devices that aren't anything like a laptop. You know, they got a whole bunch of satellites and Lord knows what else running this stuff on esoteric chips that haven't been invented yet. So we are up in that patent-filled space, even here. I actually think uh, that we are in for about a copyright trolling in this space as well. Mm. Um, how many of you have actually read all the way through the BSD or MIT licenses? All right. Okay. Well, so. I, yeah, oh, yeah. I get, right. Yeah. No, I'm not going to read it now. I, I will tell you that the, the sort of common mythology about these licenses is that do whatever you want. And that is mostly true, except for the asterisk of, but if you deliver the software to somebody, you've got to give them a copy of this license, mm -hmm. right? Now that is not, not hard to do, and yet virtually nobody does it, right? Um, and somebody is going to, just as the previous talk in this room was in part about people inserting deliberate uh, security vulnerabilities into people's web stacks. I think we are going to see somebody insert a deliberate legal vulnerability. Mm -hmm. They're going to build a useful library or buy a useful library from the copyright holder, and then they are going to they're going to use you know one of the scanning tools to like essentially say, "Hey, I noticed that your website is using my library." You're talking like you think that hasn't already happened. I have only I have never seen public record of it happening. Uh, I, well, I, I sus there's a uh, amicus brief, uh, safe amicus word. Brief. Yes, yes. Um, <laughs> um, you're also kind of moving toward that last question that I was going to ask about um, predictions. But before we before we get to that, um, I wanted to make sure that we we talked about the other thing that I know that um, this room is, cares quite a bit about, which is the sustainability of the commons. 
um, and sort of the, the 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 funding piece was was play a big role in sort of figuring out the, the business of open source as well. Um, I think everybody here cares about that, and uh, I imagine Tideless has something to say about it. Yeah, sure. So <laughs> I mean, uh, so you know, we have observed that there's a lot of money floating around for really high profile projects, right? Uh, and this is something that. WC3, I think, and Oasis have, have seen as well. If you have something that's way up at the top of the stack, uh, it is there's a lot of money floating around in the system right now. It's not that hard to get funding for it, right? Uh, it's not easy, but it, it it's doable. Uh, but then you do a scan of what people are actually using, and there's literally hundreds of libraries that are somebody's part-time project. And that plays into questions like, the security vulnerabilities that we were seeing earlier, and the general just uh, cost of using this stack, right? You have all spent time discovering that some library you thought you, you know, that you were relying on is like, oh, this actually hasn't been updated in four years, and now it doesn't work with something else, and you know, um, and and we think that that cost of that way of doing business is bad for developers, right? Like it me, it leads to burnout. Uh, it leads to abandoning projects that you once loved, but your day job is now, you know, your day job switched from being a Java shop to a Ruby shop, and now your Java projects are abandoned, right? Or, um, you know, I mean, this is obviously a JavaScript shop, but, you know, things that were dependent on jQuery, now everybody's moving to Vue or pick your flavor of the week, right? Um, and that's, uh, that leads to a lot of costs for the businesses that are using it. So we think that at least part of the solution here is actually treating this like a business, right? Not just a charity, but actually going out and saying, hey, your business depends on this. We can make it more reliable if we pay the developers who are doing the work. Uh, and that is one approach. There's many others, right? Open Collective is great. They are doing the pass the, pass the hat kind of thing. There's industry consortia, right? I mean, W3C, Oasis, Linux Foundation are all essentially passing the hat at the industrial scale in some mm -hmm. sense, right? Um, and, and, and that in, in certain spaces works very well. Uh, you know, Tidelift thinks that that's not gonna work for the little, for the, those smaller pieces of, of things, right? Um, so that's sort of where we're focused on. I don't, I, I don't wanna turn this into a pitch session, but anybody who wants to talk about it, feel <laughs> free to come up. My other hat, I am, we're small enough that I am, I am human resources. <laughs> I'm the general counsel and I also uh, head our DevRel team, so, uh, and. So yeah, so I drew the long straw of coming to Montreal yeah. in December. <laughs> yes. I am the San Francisco office. Uh, no, that's not true. As of last week, we have two people in San Francisco. Um, so I don't know if that one again. Let me have some fun with this and throw a rock. Uh, one of the ways that the balance between big and little players, patent holders, trolls, and non-combatants, and other sort of uh, asymmetrical parties are going to be disrupted is a prediction I'm gonna offer you. And that is, in spite of the fact that everybody makes fun of it, and in spite of the fact that all these fat old cis white guys like me who run some of the older organizations seem to not take it seriously, the ethical license people are going to prevail at some point, okay? the all software is good no matter what. Everybody can use anything, and I don't care if my stuff is used to jail babies, people. The old school open source approach that says no one gets to withhold their labor from anything no matter how evil, that's not going to be the only model forever. Read ethical license. Search the phrase ethical license if you're not familiar with this. There is a growing set of what I would call new wave approaches or differences or twists on open source licensing that basically create exceptions for various reasons. And some of those are going to exclude some large organizations. And that's gonna mess this all up. That it, it's coming, I, I, can, I can see it from here. Uh, we don't know what's gonna happen yet, I don't know how fast it's gonna happen, but there will people, be people who are willing to contribute to the commons for some purposes, but not for other purposes. And that will also cause some kind of regrouping or segregation or set of conditions that will have to be coped with just as the GPL license was disruptive 15, 20 years ago, and it basically landed in a field of other licenses, and everybody looked at it and said, whoa, 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 but, but if I use this, I, I can't use anything else, and oh my God, stars and garters. I mean, believe me, uh, the people who were in our jobs as, as IPR lawyers for software 
20 years ago, almost all had vapors about the GPL because they couldn't figure out how to use it with anything else and not have the world break. And it took a while for people to figure out that there are actually, you can have modules next to other modules and even Moglin wrote some things to make it clear that this wasn't you know, eating the entire world, it was just for certain areas and that there are ways for this stuff to coexist and they created the LGPL and they made it easier. But there will be more perturbation in licensure and more people insisting that other values be supported and that will destabilize and mess up some of these current relationships and power relationships, which I think is going to be really interesting. Hopefully I retire before it Because <laughs> I've got thoughts on I, that I, I like, love that you decided like at the very end of this to open the ethical licensing can of worms, James. It's awesome. Uh, we, we are kind of uh, running low on time, so I think I will ask you all to make your predictions for 2020. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, boy, I mean, Jamie stole mine right out of the, <laughs> I 100% I agree that that's going to be, you know, I think the other interesting thing is going to be, this is maybe not a 2020 thing, but in the next, say, three to five years, mm -hmm. uh, the, the security presentation from the sneak guy here was terrifying, right? Nothing new, but put a lot of things together. This, this idea that we can write some letters in all caps and for those of you who have, since I guess none of you read the BSC license, it says, it's got this all cap section that basically says, oh yeah, if you break it, if it's broken, hey, not my problem, your problem. As you swear it, bug off. Basically. Right, yeah. Uh, and, uh, and that's, I think at some point that's not going to hold, mm -hmm. right? I think the security risks to the literally civilization are going to be too high uh, and we're all going to have to clean up. Yeah, and I, I don't know how lawyers are going to be involved in that, but I suspect we will. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think in, in the, the doom and gloom um, <laughs> por portion of predictions, I think we're, we're seeing uh, regulators and legislators being lots more interested in what we create with code, whether that's round three of the encryption wars of you know, law enforcement need back doors. Sorry, you can't build a secure back door. Build us one anyhow. Uh, or you know, liability for platforms and uh, for what users post on them. Uh, you may uh, CDA 230 uh, is the, uh, the the protection that uh, platforms have had uh, against being liable for you know, what users post. Uh, yet we're more and more concerned about abuse, about misinformation, about uh, harassment online, and finding the right balance between you know, who takes responsibility, how, uh, and what are the legal hooks for that responsibility. Uh, you know, how do we you know, build these you know, other kinds of communities on top of software without undermining the protections that we have for you know, building good software? Uh, is I think going to be you know, a, a, a challenge of our next, say, five years. Any optimistic yeah, uh, yeah, predictions? Okay. Let's let a light note. <laughs> I, I think we're going to find that all of the current hyper-categorized beliefs that a standard and a code module and a model and a markup and an API are all different things is going to fall away and simplify. Because mm -hmm. you know what? Yeah, we are in a world now where one, tr where all that stuff is one transform away from another, and and some of those transforms are canonical and bilateral and actually freaking work, which is not where we were a few years ago. So I think we're going to find that the output you create in whatever form or serialization happens to exist in, whether it's a code or a spec or an API, whatever it is, we're going to discover that there's a much more uniform set of safe principles and methods for procuring, finding these things. I mean, why do we find code? Uh, or, or score people's uh, you know, uh, uh, PR points on GitHub using code, but we don't do that with standards. Why are Oracle and Google spending $50 million arguing over what an API is? We're using the damn things all the time. Why are we agonizing over their exact categorization? I think some of those artificial distincts are gonna fall away, and it's actually gonna render what we all do a lot simpler. And so just as we used to see some of the, uh, the uh, integrated development environments do this, you won't be having people hand code so much in your stuff. You'll be seeing people creating models and then being able to implement them immediately without having to get in there like Keebler's elves and handcraft every piece of it. And I think as all that unifies more, it will create a simpler and safer environment where a lot of these sneaky distinctions that weasels use to mess up your life 
will fall away. We're going to keep winning. Yay! Uh, I mean, I think that's the, you know, the, the idea that open source would literally take over the world in the way it has would have sounded ludicrous mm -hmm. uh, 20 years ago, even 10. And, I, 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 you know, all this, all the griping that we've got here at the table, that's all, that's all at the edges of the thing, right? Like, the core model works, and we're going to keep winning, and that's... Still, sometimes I wait. I, you know, there's like a legal conference. All lawyers get together. Microsoft has started attending all of these with their lawyers, right? Like, <laughs> the, like that. That was sort of my big like. Oh, right. Yeah. This is this is real. We're we winning. Want, yeah. yeah, and I'll follow up on that. That I think we're getting better at building communities around mm -hmm. these, the uh, around the code and communities that have values and ethics and privacy uh, practices and other things that we value as well as the quality of the code and its interop. So I think we're, we're getting better at building, you know, code for good society. Absolutely. Got time for one anecdote? All we do is Ooh, win. I, no I don't know, let's, let's debate that one some other day. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to take away from DJ Khaled over there. But, um, <laughs> I know a foundation that I work with who was agonizing over how to create a testing and sort of a, a certification program, and they had this debate that went kind of like this. Well, should we just issue reference code and make everybody use it? Or should we create a model and require everybody to obey the model? Or should we create an API with a, as a specification and spell it all out and make everybody obey the data structure and the code? Because they needed wide interoperability across a whole bunch of governments for a complicated purpose. Or, or should we just set it up, uh, set up a test client and say, you know, this isn't canonical, but it's a reference implementation. And if you can talk to it, you win. And you know what their answer was, actually? Their answer was, don't care. Any one of those works. Mm -hmm. Which is my point, yeah. right? If we can get to agreed structures, then you have, you don't have to sit up all night with the teams of lawyers worrying about the little Rococo technical details of how you license this little piece of that and whether it's really an API or not, and whether it's really copyrightable or not, or how the patent lawyer should approach it. You know, if you make this stuff simple, it works. And as Louis says, yeah. we're uh, open development is winning. Yeah. Thank heaven. Well, panelists, if any of that happens. I'll ask you about it next time at the next Node Plus JS Interactive. Who's um, been watching Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me? <laughs> um, I, I, everyone, I will just give it up for these, uh, these very <laughs> generous uh, uh, attorneys. Um, and please do uh, come to speak with them today about the W3C, Tidelift, or Oasis. Thank you all very, very much.